Hello brothers and sisters of Christ. Today we're going to be doing a courageous man, foolish man. Make sure to have your King James Bible out, God's perfect written word for English speaking people, and follow along, okay? Remember, these studies are not to discourage you, it's to encourage you to be courageous versus being foolish. Okay? That's the whole point of these studies. So turn to Mark chapter 5. Turn to Mark chapter 5 where we get started. Courageous man or foolish man? A man with an unclean spirit. All right? We've heard this story. You've probably heard this story preached on a lot. We're going to focus at the end. Okay, We're going to go through the whole story. We're going to make a few comments to the story. But we're going to focus mainly on the state of the man at the end. Okay? So turn to Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Okay. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gardenians. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Now the lost world would look at this and go, wow, this man's very strong. That's a good thing, right? He's very strong. But you don't have to turn here, but 2 Corinthians 12, 10, when it comes to somebody who's saved, why does God put us in such a weak state all the time as a saved sinner. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, Therefore I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress. For what? Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. When we, we, when I, we put the flesh down, the body's weak, when we say the world's not in charge, God can be in charge, okay? But the world will look at this man and say, hey, he's so strong. I'm not strong. Jesus Christ is strong. And we're going to get into this a little bit more further down, okay? He thinks he's some great guy. He's, some people look at him and say, he's so strong and he's great. How many of you have seen people out there? When I was younger, there used to be so-called Christian teams. I forgot what they're called, but these strong men would go and they'd rip uh, phone books in half. They'd break out of cuffs and everything. Oh, that's strong. That's strong. Uh, this guy will find out he's, he's, he's got a demon inside of him. But the point I'm making is, is, in order to get truly saved and born again, you've got to come to God broken. This man, people look at him, he's so strong, he's so strong. You've got to come, to, you've got to come before God as a weak man. Not a strong man. Okay. This man's so tough, but he's still in a he's still a prisoner. As we get on with the story, this man looks so tough, and he's so strong. He's ripping this apart. He gets to live however he wants to live, and everything. He's his own boss, but he's still a prisoner. Okay. So we're going to find that as we keep reading. He's a slave to his flesh. Mark five five. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Brothers of Christ, you ever know that the love of money and power in this world, all these people that have all this riches and all this power, even people out there that profess to be saved, when I say riches and power, let's stop for a second. When I say rich, riches and powers, Brothers of Christ, I'm not talking about multi-billionaire, trillionaire, uh, millionaire people. Those are the big obvious ones. I mean, they're just obvious. You look at them, Hollywood, uh, the music industry, government, they're all miserable. They have all this money, they have all this power, and they're miserable. Have you ever noticed that? But among uh, even the lower classes, when you get someone who's money-oriented, where m the love of money, because you have people that gamble, that are dirt poor, but they have a love of money. Just, you don't have to be rich. If they're not rich, then they don't have the love of money. No. The love of money can still be there, and you can be dirt poor. When you put money as a, as, as a priority, power and money, money and power, they usually go hand in hand. Okay? I've seen brethren that fall away and start getting into the world and start getting into the love of money. They start getting into, you know, be having the power of their own life, doing things that they want to do, doing things their way. And what happens is they wind up being miserable. 
They're just miserable. You look at this man, he was strong, he could live however he wanted, and yet he was miserable. He was completely and utterly miserable. Mark 5, 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. This is a man possessed with the devil. He ran and worshipped him. I know you've heard us say this before, brothers of Christ. Just because someone sits there and says, I love Jesus, and they can sing a hymn, and they can fall on their knees and oh, to Jesus, that doesn't mean they're saved. Why? Because devils were doing it. Demon-possessed people were falling down before Jesus Christ. And they not only worshipped him, let's keep reading, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? All you have to do is confess, confess that Jesus is the Son of God. That's it. Devils were also doing it. You just have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The devils were also doing it. They believed. What's the difference? Repentance. That's the difference. The devils are not sorry. It's a little you know, rabbit trail. Devils are not sorry for sinning against God. They're not. They have no sorrow. They don't fear. They, they have a fear of God, as we see here, but they're not sorry for, their, for sinning against Him, for going against Him. People who try to take repentance out of salvation, what they're doing is they don't want to see you get saved. They don't want to see brethren get... I mean, brothers and sisters Christ, we got saved through repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. I understand this is Old Testament, but we're going to see how God saved this man in the Old Testament. But how do we get saved today? That's how we get saved today. People don't want to, servants of Satan are promoting this easy believism. They don't want to see you get saved. They take repentance out and say it's only belief. It's only belief. It's only belief. No repentance. Now they're taking prayer out. You don't confess both in prayer and you don't ask God to save you. You earned it with your belief. Did you believe? Then you're saved. You earned it. God has to save you because you believed. But we see here that some of the characteristics to these false gospels that are out there, the devils are also doing it. They worshipped him. They feared him. They confessed who he was. Son of the Most High God. I, uh, I adjure thee by God that thou torments me not. There's the fear. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered and said, My name is Legion, for we are many. When I read this verse, Brother Sis Christ, if you want to, remember you can always pause the video and turn, but turn, keep your hand there and turn to Luke 11, 24. When you listen, you read this story about the state of this man. He's got the strength. He, he can live however he wants. He can do whatever he wants. Nobody can stop him. Nobody can tell him what to do. And how does he live his life? He lives in the tombs. He's cutting himself. He's crying all the time. He's miserable. He can do whatever he wants, and he's miserable. Okay. We read this, that it talks about, hey, legion, there's more than one devil inside this guy. One devil's in charge, it seems, but there's more than one devil in him. One more, more than one evil spirit in him. So what does this remind me of? Sometimes I remember Luke 11, chapter, 20, chapter 11, verse 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. Jesus is telling a parable. And findeth none. When the unclean spirit's gone, that's just one. He findeth none. He said, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell. There. And the last state of the man is worse than the first state. Brother says Christ, the last state of the man is worse than the first. Now, I'm not saying this is exactly what's happening in Mark 5, but there's a lot of similarities. This guy had to get himself in such a worse state. Okay? But man, that, that man's state is very bad in Mark 5 that we're reading. He's possessed with multiple evil spirits. He's living in the tombs. He's cutting himself. He's crying. 
but he's strong. No man can stop him from living his life. No man can stop him breaking the chains. No man tells him what to do. He's still a prisoner. But the lost world will look at this guy and go, man, this guy, he's so strong. He's just so great. Man, he's living the life. He's got it made. Nobody tells him what to do. Nobody controls him. He's the master of his own destiny. You ever heard that saying? Yeah. Okay. Brothers and sisters in Christ, now I pray and I pray that your state wasn't as bad as this man. But we all have testimonies, brothers and sisters of Christ, that when we were lost, we were in a state like this. Not exactly like hard, hardcore, but we're in a lost state. We're, our state before we got saved is worse than our state now. Is it not? Paul says that he was the chiefest of sinners. He says, I'm the chiefest of sinners, talking about his lost life. But in his saved life, he's preaching, are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid how we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. There's a changed life. Brother, sister Christ, like this man, I understand salvation at this time is Old Testament. It's not New Testament. But you compare it to how he got saved then, and you compare it to how we get saved now. Was our state better when we were lost? Or now that we're saved? Think about that. Right. Yet you and I were once in an awful state. I'm just reading my notes. You and I were once in an awful state until someone came along. Let's keep reading. Who came along in, the, in Mark 5? Jesus Christ. Today who comes along? An evangelist. Someone who preaches the true plan of salvation, preaches Jesus Christ to you. And you get saved. You fall on your knees in repentance before God, and you get saved. Mark chapter 5, verse 10. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Talking about the demons. Don't send us away. Now there were... Now there was there nigh unto the mountain a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. In other words, if they had a huge herd of like 50 swine, one devil for each swine, that's how many were in the man. It doesn't give us an exact number, but it says there was a great herd of swine feeding. To me, if you saw like 10, that's not great. Maybe 20, but if you're talking about back then, because back then when they had a herd, they had a herd. It's not like today. Back then, a great herd would be like 50 or 100. That's a lot of demons to be in one man. Verse 13, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. And they were about 2,000. It does give us a number. I'm sorry. But at first when it said swine, but it said there were about 2,000. Forgive me. Um, and were choked in the sea. So I'm thinking 200 is a great herd for today, but remember we read in the Bible when they did animal sacrifices in the Old Testament? How they'd sacrifice thousands upon thousands of goats, bulls. There were about 2,000 evil spirits in this guy. Remember what we just read there? His state is worse than it was before. You have people, I don't know what, how to say this, but you have people, it's just another rabbit trail. You have people that they get preached the gospel to. And they get a little excited. This might, it'd be nice to go to heaven. It'd be nice to go to heaven. But they don't truly repent. They don't truly let God save them. And when they try to, and when they go back to the world, you ever notice these people that they, they all try religion. I'll try it. It sounds good. I'll try it. And they try it for a little bit. And eh, this isn't for me. And they go back to the world. They end up being 10, 20, 30 times worse than they were before they came there. Do you ever notice that? I was a false comfort in the battle building system. Okay? I can attest to that. Okay? I've seen it. I and mean, today with all these professing Christians, today the big lie is they're being told that you can continue your religion and continue to be part of your club and still have the world. But back in the day, it wasn't so. If you were going to claim to be a Christian, you better act like one, you better look like one, you better talk like one, you better live like one, or we're going to look at you and say, you're not saved. So they say, hey, we'll try it out. It sounds great. We'll try it out. 
And then when it's like, ugh, this isn't for me, they go back to the world. Do you ever notice how they become 10, 20 times worse than they did when they first came there? God's like, I can save you. Well, I don't really want to be saved from my sins, but, but I'll try this out. I'll try to be part of this club. And they go back to the world, and pff, they're worse. Right? Who choked in the sea, and they that fled that fed the swine fled, they that fed the swine fled, and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was, see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion. They seen this man, but there's something different. Let's keep reading. He's sitting, he's clothed and clothed, and in his right mind, He's not naked anymore. He's in his right mind. Right? And they were afraid. They didn't come and say, okay, look at all these sheep. Because I want to make this point. They didn't come here and say, look at all these pigs. I'm sorry, these pigs, these swine. They're all gone. They're dead and they're in the water. Dead. Look at all these swine in their bodies. Oh, we're getting filled from all these dead pigs. That's not what scared them. What scared them, brothers, is Christ according to the scriptures. They looked at the man that Jesus saved. They looked at that man and said, and got scared. They didn't look at that man and go, wow, you saved him? I mean, look how bad this man was. Look at the estate that this man's in. You saved him? I'm not, I'm not saying this is to be prideful or anything, but like you have that saying today, I'm not as bad as this man, but you look and go, I'm not possessed with a million devil, uh, 2,000 devils. I'm not like this guy was. And if Jesus could save this guy, maybe he can save me. They didn't have that attitude. Remember how I say that, brothers of Christ? I always say, if God can save a wretched, wicked sinner like me, he can save anyone today. Okay, He can save anyone today. And there's brethren out there that have testimonies where their life was worse than mine. But still, I claim that you know, if God can save me, he can save you. And it's not a competition, please. It's not a competition. I don't. Those brethren that have testimonies where they went through worse stuff than I ever went through, um, they wouldn't wish that on on you, brother, sis, Christ. They wouldn't wish it on me. It's just that's the testimony God gave them, and God can save them. God can save anyone. They look at this guy and how bad he is, and goes, "Wow, this man." They might not have known his name, Jesus, yet, but this man, who's Jesus, he saved this guy. Maybe he can save me too. Maybe I need some saving. But that wasn't their attitude. They saw what Jesus Christ did to, for this man, and what it, were they? They were afraid. And they, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was uh, uh, possessed with the devils, and also concerning the swine. They didn't they tell him about the swine, but they saw the man and were scared. Not the swine, the man. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. Why do I believe they said that? Because what if he makes me give up that life? I don't want to be in I want nobody in charge of me. I don't want nobody telling me what to do. I like to go to heaven and everything, but I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. And look at the effect that this man had on him. He changed his life. The man doesn't get to do whatever he wants anymore. The man's not this great, strong man that can break chains anymore. Look how weak he is now. That's the type of man that comes to God broken, weak. I can't do it on my own. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to, to thy cross I cling. But this is Christ, I believe that. These guys looked at what Jesus did for that man and said, I don't want Jesus doing that for me. I don't want him doing it for me. Can you please leave? How many times have you had that people treat you like that when you try to witness to him for Jesus Christ? Oh, I don't want anything to do with you, Jesus Christ. Can you please leave? We, we don't want, we don't want your, your kind here. We don't want your kind here. Please leave. Please leave. Were these men courageous or foolish? I think a lot of the brothers out there would be jumping up and down saying they were foolish. 
Jesus, God manifest in the flesh was standing right there. He could have saved them from whatever problems they had. But they told him, get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Leave. 19. And here's how we're going to, I know this took a while to get into the study, but his, here's how we're going to get into the meat of this study. Verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, I'm sorry, depart out of their coast. Verse 18. Mark 5, 18. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Here's our first part to being a courageous man, foolish man for this story. Is your heart full desire to be with Jesus Christ? And we're going to talk about this. We're going to break it up after we finish this story. His heart full desire was to be with Jesus Christ. His heart full desire was not, I'm going to go back into the world. Okay, thank you, Jesus, for casting out those demons. I'm going to take these clothes off. I'm going to go back into the, the tombs. I'm going to start cutting myself. I'm going to start crying. Uh, I'm going to start living the way I was before. No, he said, I want to be with you, Jesus. He had a heartfelt desire to be with Jesus Christ. Not only that, let's keep reading. 19, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. Jesus gave him a command. You love me, you want to be with me, but I need you to do this instead. Here's the command. What did the guy do? And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. He had a desire to please God and do his will. That's the second part. First one, he had a desire to be with Jesus Christ. Despite what those other people were saying, they wanted Jesus gone. He didn't want Jesus gone. He had a desire to be with Jesus Christ. And then Jesus said, no, this is what I need you to do for me right now. Jesus gave a command. He had a heartfelt desire to please God and do his will. And he did. He didn't just say, I, I want to do what God wants. He actually did it. That's a big thing in these last days, brothers and Christ, and I keep pushing this, and I keep pushing this, and trying to drive it home. It's not just words, it's deeds. The man didn't look at Jesus and say, sure, I'll do that. And then when Jesus was gone on the boat, he went back to living how he wanted to live, in the tombs, cutting himself. No, he actually did it. He said he'd do it, he did it. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest point I point out here is, is when the man was saved, there was a changed life. And after he got saved, he, he wanted, had a desire to be with Jesus Christ, and he had a desire to do his will. To please him and do his will. And that's what we're going to be talking about for this courageous man, foolish man. We've got the story. We know what happened. A lot of people have stories in the transformation of how this guy got saved, went from the old man to the new man. Okay? How Jesus saved him. But for this study, we're going to be talking about courageous man, foolish man. Those two heartfelt desires, are they still in your life, brothers and Christ? To be with Jesus Christ and to do his will. Are those two desires still here? Are you starting to act like those foolish men? Oh, we really don't, oh, we'll put Jesus on the shelf. We'll put our Bible over there and let it gather dust. Uh, we'll, put, we'll put, you know, God's commandments and what God wants for me. We're going to put it to the side, and we're going to start, you know, getting into the world. And you start realizing you're acting like those men. We don't want Jesus. We want the world. We don't want Jesus telling us what to do. We like our flesh telling us what to do. We like man, my, me, myself, and I telling me what to do. All right. Now remember, we're going to start with the first one. Had a desire to be where with Jesus and where Jesus is. Now this might shock some of you because a lot of people don't preach on this that much anymore, but you know where to, where to find Jesus down here? People say, well, Jesus is in you. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Yes, Jesus said, I will be with you. And then he talks about the, sending the uh, Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Okay, Jesus said, I am in you and you are in me. Just as he said, I'm in the Father, talking about Jesus Christ, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. 
Right? Our soul is connected to the body, Jesus Christ. We are all in Christ Jesus our Lord. However, Matthew, turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. This is very telling. Right? Matthew 18, verse 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, not just gathered together, a social club, not just gathered together to play games and have fun, fun is flesh, flesh is fun, just, you know, social hour. In my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, we did a whole study, and I'm not going to get into it too much here, but we did a whole study. Go watch it. It says, people all around, but still lonely. Put out that study in February 6, 2023, this year. February 6. All right? People all around, but still lonely. Brothers, is Christ, is your heartfelt desire to be where Jesus is? Well, when the body of Christ comes together in true fellowship, Jesus is there. And what's true fellowship? Okay, confessing your faults one to another. Worshiping God together, singing hymns. Okay? You confess your faults one to another so you can pray for one another and hold each other accountable to the Word of God and encourage them. The Bible always talks about um, exhorting the brethren. That's encouraging the brethren to stay on that narrow path. Don't fail the Lord. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. Don't go back to the world. Don't keep the flesh down. Don't let the flesh be in charge. The Holy Spirit's supposed to be in charge. Romans chapter 8. Spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. That's how it's supposed to be. Keep putting that flesh down. You confess your faults. You confess your walk, how your walk is going with the Lord, so you know what to pray for one another. Okay? You sing hymns. You listen to Bible reading. That's a hard one, because you don't see that often anymore. Everyone always like, I've got to listen to somebody preach and tell me what he thinks about the Bible. When's the last time in these battle buildings have you come to a service where a guy stands up there and just reads the Bible for 20 minutes? Because remember, their teachings are only like 15, 20 minutes when, you get down, when it gets down to it. Well, if you're only going to do a 15-minute study, so-called study or preaching, you might as well just read the Bible. The Bible talks about how we're supposed to read the Pauline epistles. We're supposed to read these letters, it said. Make sure you're reading these letters to people constantly. But we met, we, like I said, you say with chapter and verse, we did it all in that study, people all around but still lonely, how Paul's heartfelt desire was to be around the brethren. Why? Because when the brethren come together, Jesus is there in the midst of them. Do you have a heartfelt desire to be where Jesus is? Are you starting to fail the Lord and trying to get off, getting, to, getting used to isolation, being isolated, and being a, what I call an online Christian. Are you failing the Lord because you prefer, because so I thought about this, I'm getting ahead of my thoughts sometimes as I'm speaking, but these battle buildings, how many of you thought to, uh, maybe I could compromise and get to go to the battle building so I can at least sing some hymns. They might not all be saved, there's not real fellowship going on, but just to be able to sing some hymns with people, to be around listening to someone read the King James Bible other than myself, to hear somebody else speak other than myself. How many of you look? I looked around my area. I started talking to the Lord. So I looked around, looked at their web, uh, the web pages of a lot of these old time uh, Christian religion buildings that claim to be Baptist and they use the King James Bible. And it's our foundation on matters of faith and practice. And you look into it and stuff, and it's like, but by the way, we offer movie night. We have poker night. We have game night. We you know we have video games for the kids nights. Video game night, and it's us all social hour. Social, social. We have potlucks, barbecues. It's all social. Don't tell me anything. I was lost. I was a false convert in these Babel buildings in a non-denominational church. You came there on Sunday morning. You listened to the guy preach for about twenty minutes. And it was fellowship hour before, and fellowship, not fellowship, I'm sorry, social hour before and social hour after. And they'd all talk about the next event that's coming up, whether it's camping, whether it's men's night out, or women's night out, or this. It was all worldly stuff. It's a club. It's a social club. I thought about it. But this is Christ. We're going to get into this next part. <laughs> Uh, talking about suffering for Jesus Christ. And one of the ways you suffer for Jesus Christ is sometimes you're going to be alone. But make sure you're alone because there's no, there's no doors open. 
what I'm trying to make here is there's still lots of doors open in that study. There's lots of doors still open for fellowship to be where Jesus Christ is and brethren aren't taking it. They've gotten, so I'm, I'm used to my life here by myself and my job and I'm not willing to sacrifice anything to be part of a house church, to be part of a meeting house, a prayer house, to be part of a flock of God. Oh, I just don't have time to get on Skype and Skype someone for an, a brother in Christ for an hour. There's two of you. Or two or more gathered in my name, they're mine in the midst of them. It can be something simple as you talk. I used to uh, Skype a lot of brethren. But in these last days, everyone's just getting too busy or getting distracted by the world or getting distracted by the flesh or, or getting that spirit today, that spirit of arguing and backbiting. But there's times I talk to multiple brethren at the same time using Skype. Do right. you have that heartfelt desire, brothers and sisters of Christ? Are you being courageous today by making sure that you've tried everything you can to be part of a fellowship of some kind? It might be an online fellowship. I'm not talking about making comments under videos. I thank the brethren for the comments. Please understand that. But that's not really good fellowship. Good fellowship is Skyping someone and sitting there and talking to somebody that's two-way. There's more a group of people, more than two way. Talking about your life, your walk with the Lord, listening to some other brother or sister in Christ talk about their walk with the Lord and actually praying for them. I don't know how many times I keep saying we need to pray, pray, pray for the brethren. Pray for the brethren. It's important in these last days. So you have that desire, fellowship. If you have a desire to be with Jesus, you have a desire for fellowship. Paul had it. Oh, every time, I wish I could be there with you, but Satan hinders. us. I wish I could be there for you. Like I said, watch that study I did. I got some thumbs down on that study. Why? Because you got brethren that desire fellowship like I do, but they're upset because they make because they think I'm pointing it out to them saying it's your fault. It might not be your fault you don't have fellowship. Then again, it might be. Are there doors open and you're not going through them? Or is there things in this world that you're holding on to because you think it's more important than fellowship? It's something for you to think of and get with the Lord between you and Him and figure it out. Okay. Two, this was going to be the obvious one that people probably thought I was going to start with this one, but this is two. So you have fellowship. When you have a desire to be with Jesus Christ, you have a desire to be with the body of Christ. To be with the body of Christ. Okay, To be around good People, saved sinners. Number two, the catching away. You're looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. John 14, 1. Turn to John 14, 1 in your King James Bibles. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there ye may be also. So when you have the, the brethren, the body of Christ, when you're around them, you're around Jesus. But there's still that heartfelt desire to someday be where Jesus is physically. Where's Jesus at? That's spiritually. The body of Christ. Physically, where's Jesus Christ at right now? He's in heaven preparing a place for us. Are you looking for that blessed hope every day with the life that you're living? That's true desire to be with Jesus. If you truly desire to be in heaven someday and be with Jesus someday, you're saved, you're sealed into the day of redemption, but we're down here for the ministry of reconciliation. And it's done tw two different ways, verbally and physically with the life you're living, being a light to this dark world. You're supposed to be both. Once again, you got a lot of people that are all talk, 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 talk. But where's the walk? Why are we still here? We're not here just to be talk. We're here to live a life of Christ and be a light to this dark world. Especially today with how wicked it is out there, brothers, says Christ. It is so wicked. Sodomy reigns supreme. Feminism reigns supreme. False gods reign supreme. The flesh reigns supreme out there. We're supposed to be an example of Jesus Christ a light that shines on all that and says that is all sin, that is all wickedness. 
In the life that you live, you have zero tolerance for this stuff. And you're to live for Jesus Christ, and when someone looks at you and says, Hey, you got something different in you. What's so different about you? It's an open door to witness. But true love, a true desire to be where Jesus is in heaven is looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. Turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 12. A lot of you know this one. Titus chapter 2, verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we're supposed to be different than the world. We should live soberly. There's, this is God commanding us what to do. And those of us who are saved, we want God to command us what to do. Remember those guys? The man that's possessed with the devil, after Jesus saved him, he wanted him commanding him and telling him what to do. But those people there didn't want that. Get out of our coast. Leave, leave. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking... Notice there's a dot comma. The sentence isn't ended. The subject matter is still going. So it talks about living a life of Christ. And verse 13 says, what is that called? That's looking for that blessed hope. All that can be summed up with looking for that blessed hope. Are you living a life of Christ? Then you're looking for that blessed hope. When you see brethren that their life doesn't quite line up with the scriptures, they're starting to look worldly, they're starting to talk like the lost world, act like the lost world, think like the lost world. You're looking at someone who's becoming part of the falling away. They're not looking for Jesus Christ anymore. They're preoccupied by things down here, mainly the flesh and the world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he that we that he might redeem us from all iniquity. I'm not redeemed from all iniquity yet. I'm still stuck in this wicked body of flesh. I am a saved sinner. That's why that verse in the First John, I think it is, it talks about if we're, he's faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're supposed to continually repent, confess our sins, turn from them, and get back to living for the Lord every day. It's a constant battle till the day that God comes and gets us and gets us rid of this wicked body of flesh, this wicked body of sinful flesh. Then we will be purified, redeemed from all iniquity, and purified to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Are you looking for that blessed hope? If you want to be where Jesus is, you have a love like this guy did, have a love to want to be where Jesus is, then you have a love of looking, living for Jesus, which is looking for that blessed hope. How is your life doing, brothers and sisters? How's your walk going? Are you looking for that blessed hope? Or you become one of those brethren that turn their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ? Put off the blessed hope. Eh, it's not happening. I, uh, when they say it's not going to happen for four or five years, what they're saying is they don't want it to happen for four or five years. They're, too, they're, they're enjoying themselves down here. Things down here are more important. They stop looking, and it starts showing in their life and how they live. They're not being a good light for Jesus Christ after a while. That light dims. It never goes out, but it dims to the point where the lost world can't hardly see it, if at all. Second right. Timothy 4.8. Turn to 2 Timothy 4.8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also that love, all them also that love his appearing. If you love his appearing, then you have it in your heart that he could come back tomorrow. I better get busy living for him today. And that's what I tell brethren. They, you have some preachers, I'm not saying they're wrong, but some stick today. If he came back right now, would you be ready? Uh, some days I'm like, absolutely take me home. There's some days where I'm like, oh Lord, you're going to catch me falling on my knees. Oh Lord, I didn't get this done for you. Oh Lord, I started to, to think bad things. Some brethren are like, hey, I started getting back into sin. I started letting some things back in my life, Lord, that you got out of my life. My priorities are starting to change. How I'm treating the brethren are starting to change. How I treat the lost world is starting to change. 
And God, I don't want you coming back and seeing me like this. I said, there's those days. Yes, I'm ready for you to come back. And there's days they're not. But this is what I say, brothers and Christ. If you knew, which we won't, but if you knew that Jesus Christ was coming back tomorrow, who cares about the past? If you knew Jesus Christ was coming back tomorrow, what would you do today? Then do it. Get busy living for the Lord. Have you prayed today? Hopefully you have. Have you read your Bible? Have you done a Bible study? Have you, when's the last time you did gospel tracking? Whether you just laying gospel places or handing it to somebody? When's the last time you like said pray for brethren? Uh, that you were there for a brethren for fellowship? When's the last time you fellowshiped with a brother or sister in Christ? Not making comments. Writing emails okay, but once again, emails are great. I, I miss a lot of the brethren that used to email me. But email is still only one way. Even Paul in his emails desired to actually be there. What are you getting done for him today? Sanctification. Get this stuff out of my life. If you knew he was coming back tomorrow, what would you do today? That's the attitude you need to have. Get busy living for him now. Don't get stuck on your failures of the past or your successes of the past. Get stuck on today. What am I going to do for God today? Lord, what do you have for me today? Lord, is there something I still need to get out of my life? Lord, is there something I still need to do? That's what it means to love His appearing and to be looking for that blessed hope. Brothers and Christ, you have a heartfelt desire to be where Jesus Christ is. I hope so. If not, this doesn't mean to beat you down. This means to convict you to say, okay, I need to, get, I need to start working on these things so I can be saying, yes, I'm, my heartfelt desire is to be with Jesus Christ in all these areas. The third one that I threw in here, God put on my heart to put in here, is the day of the Lord. And some of you would go like, well, what does that have to do with being with Jesus Christ? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. It says here, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, we, he will also deny us. The day of the Lord, remember it says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. It's properly called the day of the Lord, not millennial kingdom. It's day of the Lord. And if you have to explain it like I just did, what is this day? This day is a thousand year time period after the time of Jacob's trouble in the future where Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. Now how hard was it to explain that? No, we need to do away with explanations and add words to the Bible. Sorry about that, Brother Stress, but I just I get that from so many people. We can add our own words and our own terms to the Bible. It's not millennial kingdom, it's day of the Lord. You know what it's also called in the Bible, Brother Jesus Christ? Some of you know Kingdom of Heaven. Kingdom of Heaven is always a reference to that physical kingdom, the thousand year uh, kingdom where Jesus Christ is going to reign, rule and reign. It's also referred to as the kingdom of God sometimes. Remember, kingdom of God can be a reference to the spiritual kingdom, which we have today, or the physical kingdom. You have to rightly divide, 2 Timothy 2.15. Okay? But it says here, if we suffer with him, we'll get to reign with him. It implies that if we don't suffer with Him, if we deny Him, He will deny us reign in that thousand year time period called the Day of the Lord. So we'll be stuck up in heaven. Is your heartfelt desire to be where Jesus is no matter where it is? If it's among the body of Christ, is your desire to be among the body of Christ? When it's in heaven, physically in heaven, spiritually body of Christ. Physically, he's in heaven. You have that desire to be in heaven with the life that you're living. To be with Jesus Christ with the life that you're living. And you got to think that thousand year period where Jesus is going to rule and reign. I want to be able to come back with him and rule and reign with him. To serve him. To be where he is. I talk to the Lord about it all the time. Lord, am I suffering for you? Or am I denying you so I wouldn't have to suffer as much? Am I denying you so I can have my flesh? Am I denying you so I can have the world?
I don't, my flesh, I don't want to, I don't want to suffer like that. There's a great song out there, uh, count your, I don't know if it was a poem or a song, but count your blessings one by one, see what the Lord has done. Count your blessings one by one, see what the Lord has done. Okay. Is God doing some amazing things in your life? Or is a lot of bad things happening in your life? Okay. Uh, Romans 8, 18. Turn to Romans 8, 18. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we suffer, brothers and Christ, is the world coming first or is Jesus Christ coming first? That's the big issue there. Okay. I started looking at my notes and I'm getting ahead of myself when I, t when I said that song. We'll get to that song. Count your blessings one by one. We will get to that. But I got ahead of myself. Forgive me. But... Are you suffering for Jesus Christ? What I meant to say was, is, are you counting the cost? Remember that. Are you counting the cost? Romans 8.18 says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That shall be revealed in us. 1 Peter 3.17 we read in 1 Peter 3.17, For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. I had to throw this one in there, Brother Strikes, because there's a lot of times in my life as a saved sinner that when things seem to fall apart so much, it wasn't because I'm suffering for Jesus Christ. Gotta get that proud stance. I'm suffering. You hear people do this. I'm suffering for Jesus Christ. No, you're suffering because you made bad decisions. You decided to go to the left or to the right and you didn't stay on that straight and narrow path. You decided to do things your way, and I'm pointing at myself. <laughs> There's a mirror behind the camera, but I'm pointing at myself. You decided to do things your way. You let the flesh have its way sometimes, giving into temptation and choosing to sin. Okay? Make sure you get the differences. There's suffering for Jesus Christ, and then there's the, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. There's consequences for living after the flesh. There's consequences for going about doing things the world's way, the flesh's way, your way, versus doing things God's way. And you need to be able to distinguish between the two. Today, you've got a lot of proud people up there saying, oh, I'm suffering for Jesus Christ. And you listen to their stories, 80 to 90% of it is their own fault. They're not really suffering that much for Jesus Christ. They refuse to suffer for Jesus Christ, and they're trying to do things the way of the world. And if you're truly saved and born again, it's all going to fall apart every time. Because your heartfelt desire is still for the Lord and for His Word as a saved sinner. Have you counted the cost? Like I said, make sure that it's suffering for Jesus Christ and not suffering consequences of the flesh or the world. 1 Corinthians 4.12 Turn to 1 Corinthians 4.12 We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Have you counted the cost, brothers of Christ? Have you counted the cost? Even into this present hour, we both hunger. There's times where I've, I've been hurting for money because I made bad decisions. Absolutely. But there's been times I've been hurting financially because I'm going through some hard times. I'm trying to live a life of Christ. I'm trying to do things God's way, and the world doesn't like it. And I'm having to face consequences from the world. I know brethren that got lost jobs because they, they stuck to Jesus Christ and His Word. Okay. Both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. That's mainly talking about someone who's in ministry. If you actually are in full-time ministry, serving the Lord fully, you're going to be able to relate to that. Not in the past, Period. Past, present, future. You're going to be able to relate to that. Because if you don't compromise, you're going to suffer for Jesus Christ. 
If you do things God's way, you're going to wind up suffering for Jesus Christ. Twelve, and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Remember what the Bible says about you don't reward evil with evil, but you overcome evil with good? Well, yeah. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Some brethren are getting persecuted and they get upset about it and they start losing their temper, they start making a scene, start, starting all the drama. Here, Paul says, they per being persecuted, we suffer it. They call me names, I'm just going to sit here and take it. We suffer it. Persecution. 13. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the, we are made as the filth of the world. And are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Until this day. His whole ministry. He had some ups and downs. He talks about how some days he was blessed more than, and some days he didn't. And he talks about, he, Paul talks about whatever state that he's in, he's learned to be content. If he's got two changes of raiment, he's content. He's only got one, he's content. If the one he has is falling apart, he praises God and he's content. Okay, there's some good days and some bad days, but overall, all, all things until this day that he's writing this letter. That's the life of someone in ministry. And brother says, Christ, if you're truly saved and born again, whether you're in ministry or not, even for the sisters in Christ, you can relate to a lot of this stuff. Have you counted the cost? Let me read this last verse, verse 14. I write not these things to shame you, if you haven't gone through these things, how dare you? He's not writing these things to shame you. But as my beloved sons, I warn you. He's warning us that when you're truly saved, there is not a cost. It doesn't cost you anything to get saved, brothers of Christ. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. It is a gift. You have to come to him broken in true biblical repentance, having sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against him. Fearing the consequences going to hell. And you come before God, before the cross, His Son, Jesus Christ, and say, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, and the blood that was shed at Calvary is God's blood, and it can cleanse me from all unrighteousness. How Jesus died, was buried, how He died for our sins, and was buried and rose again the third day, proving that He is God. It's God's blood. Lord, I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell, Lord. Please save me. Confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you. You do that, you get truly saved. You're going to have to, like I said, that's a gift. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. People always confuse what we're saying. We say it costs, have you counted the cost? It costs something in this wicked world. It costs something to be a Christian, not get saved after you're saved. It's going to start costing you to stand up for Jesus Christ. Family. Jesus said, if a man love father or mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. If a man loves son or daughter more than me, he's not worthy of me. Bible, Paul talks about how you fall in the trap of trying to please your wife, or a wife trying to please their husband, over pleasing God. Have you counted the cost? When I got saved, my friends went from boom to boom. Talk about worldly. I've had family members turn on me. I have family members that can't handle talking to me for more than five minutes on the phone. We used to talk for hours, and now that after five minutes, they want to hang up. Because I don't want to talk about the filth of the world. I keep wanting to talk about Jesus and what Jesus is doing in my life. He did this for me. He blessed me with these eggs, chickens. Okay? He blessed me with snow today. He blessed me with this. Oh, praise God, he did this for me. Oh, I failed the Lord here and everything's like, they don't want to hear that stuff, me giving God the glory. They don't want to hear me calling sin for what it is, sin. Have you counted the cost? The Bible says in all things, whether in word or in deed, do all to the glory of God. Giving God thanks in all things. I've lost family members. I've lost friends. I lost my daughter to the world. And then in death. 
I had that brother and attack me for. I'll take it. You can attack me all you want, I'll take it. They're wrong what they're saying, but I'll take it. I've lost my daughter. I lost my wife. Okay. A brother in Christ was, uh, was trying to exhort me, talking about being lonely. Lord, brother in Christ, I get very lonely a lot. Why? Because of mistakes I made? I could say a little bit, yeah, because a little bit of mistakes I made, but mostly because I'm standing for the Word of God. I've lost brethren. Which leads me to this one. I lost brethren. I lost brethren to worldly, to the way of the world, and the world's thinking, and they're not putting the Word of God first. The flesh comes first before the Word of God, before the brethren, being a servant to the brethren, loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters Christ, have you counted the cost? Yes or no? It costs something to be saved today, especially today with how wicked it is out there. If you're living right and you're standing for what is right, it's going to cost you something in this wicked world. You're going to wind up suffering for Jesus Christ. You don't have to go out of your way. I don't have to go stand on the street corner with a sign that I know what's going to offend people and watch people beat me up and drop me down there. You don't have to do that. Now, if God calls you to go in a group with uh, street witnessing, I'm all for street witnessing. But I'm saying you don't have to do that to suffer for Jesus Christ. You don't have to throw yourself in front of the bus to suffer. In other words, suffer for Jesus Christ. The bus is going to veer off the road and try to run you over on the side of the road if you're just living for Jesus Christ. Okay? You don't have to jump in front of the bus to suffer for Jesus Christ. But the Bible talks about, sorry I went off on this a little too much, but suffering for Jesus Christ. You get to be with Jesus Christ in the day of the Lord, ruling and reigning right beside Him. Under Him, remember He's our King of Kings. That's why He's called capital K, King of lowercase kings, K Kings. That's not talking about worldly kings, even though we try to use it for that. But honestly, it's applied to that day of the Lord. Where they're gonna, we're going to be ruling and reigning with Him, and He's capital K King of lowercase K Kings. Capital L Lord of lowercase L Lords. Are you suffering for Him? Do you have that mindset? I talk to Him all the time about the day of the Lord. What's it going to be like? What's He going to have us doing? And I just get into conversations sitting out on the deck talking to the Lord. But the most important part of that conversation that I have with him is, Lord, am I suffering enough? I'm not trying to go out of my way, but am I not, am I not, am I putting the flesh first so I don't have to suffer? Am I putting the world first so I don't have to suffer? Am I putting my wife first so I don't have to suffer? Am I putting my children first so I don't have to suffer for Jesus Christ? Am I putting my family and friends first and etc. 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 And I put anything first so I don't have to suffer for you, Lord. Am I suffering for you? Am I putting you first? Just putting God first with the life that you live, not in words, but in deed, you'll suffer for Jesus Christ. John 7, 7 we read, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Now, before real quick, because the Lord put this on my heart, I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. Please understand, there's times that I have suffered hardcore. I think the worst times in my life as a saved sinner have not been because of me suffering for Jesus Christ. The hardest times in my life, and I've been saved going on nine, ten years, the hardest times in my life as a Christian is because I put this first, or I put the world first. I made bad decisions. And you know what? God saved me. I suffered, let me know it for like hard, hard times, and God picked me up out of it. And He saved me from it. Present tense. But the hardest times in my life isn't my suffering for Jesus Christ, it's suffering because of me. Just so you know, I'm not trying to lift myself, I'm just explaining some things I lost. Putting God first. Ultimately, I had to put the God first, and I lost those things, those people in my life. But John 7, 7, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Remember, the world's supposed to be seeing Jesus Christ in you. 
John 15, 18 says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You know why the, the world doesn't hate me? I'm telling you right now, the world, the lost world doesn't hate me. They hate, they hate Jesus Christ that's shining through me. I'm being a light for Jesus Christ. When the world starts to say, hey, you know, you're, you're, you claim to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or, or, or woman out there, but you're a cool person. I love hanging out with you. You're just so awesome and everything. You're not shining for Jesus Christ. If you're truly shining for Jesus Christ, this world is, oh, I'm not talking about, I have neighbors that they help me, I help them. And that's the extent of it. I'm not rude to them, they're not rude to me, but they don't love me. They don't love me. They don't look at me like I'm just this great guy that they love to hang out with and be around. I don't know. Right? So let's wrap that, the, we'll, we'll make this a part one, we'll split it off into a part two. But the first part there is, do you have a desire to be with Jesus Christ, brother says Christ? Do you have a desire to be with Jesus? Whether it's with fellowship, whether it's with the life that you're living looking for that blessed hope, whether it's with the life you're living when it comes to suffering for Jesus Christ so you can be where He is in the day of the Lord, to be able to come back and rule and reign with Him. Do you have that heartfelt desire to be with Jesus Christ? What about the second part? A desire to obey Jesus and witness. To obey God's commands in the life that you're living, which we already talked about a little bit, but also witness for Jesus Christ. John 14, 15, we read, how many times do you hear people say this? I love Jesus, I love Jesus. That's just words. And I always try to hammer this home, and the lost world, the easy believism, the Bible perversionists, the false religions, the atheists, they hate this. They hate it. They don't want anybody else being in charge. They like being in charge of their own world. They like to be the ones that say, a better rendering would be. They're saying, thus saith the Lord, but what they're really saying is, thus saith my feelings and opinions and preferences, what I want. I'm the commander-in-chief, not Jesus Christ. What is it, the Bible definition, what does it mean to love Jesus Christ? John 14, 15 Turn to John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Wait, wait, wait. You mean loving God is an action? It's a physical action. It's not words. It's not emotions. It's a heartfelt feeling that I have here. It's action. The heartfelt desire is to obey God. That's here. And there's times we fail the Lord. I failed him. But that heartfelt desire to please God and to do His will, obey His commands, that does start here. But true love for Jesus Christ is, is proven by deeds and action. That's where you can tell, see that someone loves Jesus Christ. John 14, 21. Jump down to 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will man my, manifest myself to him. You ever heard people, I don't really see Jesus in my life. Well, do you truly really love Jesus? Oh yeah, I love Jesus Christ, but I don't really see Jesus Christ in my life. Because they don't understand what love God, loving Jesus is. Are you keeping his commandments? Are you living a life of Christ? If you're living the life of Christ... He's going to manifest himself in your life. You're going to see Jesus in the life that you're living, in you. You're going to see it in brothers and sisters in Christ. The lost world's going to see it in us. I sat there and prayed, and I talked to the Lord, and there's times where I'm like, I hate being alone, and the Lord just, it's like, it's like someone tapping me on the shoulder going, what, you, am I invisible? Am I not here? And it's, and it's God, Jesus, through Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. I'm with you. You're not alone. I'm with you. You're right, Lord. You're right. I might be physically alone, but I'm never really truly alone. God is with me. Paul said that a lot. There's times where he felt like he was utterly alone, but then he got, to correct him, got corrected. But he's not alone. God is with him. Jesus is with him. All right? You want him to be manifest in your life? Are you living a life of Christ? Are you obeying him? He gives you a call and says, I want you over here. Are you over there? If 
He's, for men in ministry, I want you doing things this way. I want you doing that. What he calls me to do might not necessarily be what he calls you to do in ministry. Okay? But are you obeying him? That's true love for Jesus Christ. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, it's a Bible if, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Today, it's the King James Bible. That's where you find God's perfect written word. King James Bible for English-speaking people. Bible if, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Make our abode with him. John 15, 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. You want the love of Jesus on you? Not his chastening. I'm not talking about wrath. The lost world has God's wrath and God's judgment upon him, but this is, I'm talking to saved sinners out there. Do you want God's love on you? Or do you want his chastening, which is still his love, but do you want the chastening or the mercy? you want uh, losing out on things, missing out on rewards in heaven? Or do you want God's, uh, the gifts that God has for you? The blessings. Okay. If, if, I, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. How many times do you hear the lost world say that? Oh, God loves me. Oh, God loves me. For the false converts. God loves me. God wouldn't send me to hell. God. Are they keeping God's commandments? What's his number one commandment for today, brothers and Christ? Do you guys know the number one commandment for today? I know a lot of you do. Or maybe you go like, is this true? I'm not trying to trick anybody up. But his number one commandment today is obey the gospel. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All these guys out there try to say that they're lost. Paul are false religions, false gospels. They'll try to say, God loves me. But are you obeying his, his command, starting with the first command for today? Obey the gospel. Repentance. Oh, no, repentance is just works. You're lost if you didn't repent. Oh, repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. You're lost. You're on your way to hell if you didn't repent. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. First Corinthians, people say, well, that's just Old Testament. You've just been quoting from John, Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament. All right. First Corinthians 8, 6. First Corinthians 8, 6. Here's a big one. It says here, but if a man, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. When it's talking about known, it's talking about your reputation. Not your words, your actions, your reputation. And remember, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. To love Jesus is to love God. But if a man love God, the same is known of him. Are you keeping God's commands? Colossians 3.12, or 3.17. Colossians 3.17, we read, And whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all to the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Deed. Not just words, but deed. And we always say, you have people out there say, well, I'm doing this for Jesus Christ. Is it in the scriptures? Chapter and verse. I had some brethren that broke fellowship with me because I hit them up with that. They were doing some pagan practices, worldly things, sinful, wicked things, and they tried to claim they're doing it for Jesus Christ. And I said, chapter and verse, where does that please God? In fact, I can show where that's sinful, that's wicked, it goes against the scriptures. But they broke fellowship with me over worldly things, sinful, wicked things. Well, this is talking about do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where to say chapter and verse? Did you pray this morning? Or does it say that? Well, the Bible says we're to pray without ceasing. Did you start your day with the Word of God? Did you end your day with the Word of God? The Bible says, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study, show thyself approved unto God. Thy word have I hid in my heart. How do you hide God's word in your heart if you hardly read it? It's something that needs to be done every day because your flesh is always going to be trying to push the Word of God out. Where does it say that? It's in the Word of God. 
And then you had somebody that was so fleshly and so wicked, I play video games for the Lord. Chat, this is the Bible, but it has the Word of God on it. But, see, this is the Word of God, but it's not the Bible. Here's the Bible that has the whole Word of God in it, the Scriptures. Chapter and verse on that one. Oh, I celebrate Christmas for Jesus Christ. Chapter and verse on that one. Now, I didn't say chapter and verse for the birth of Jesus Christ. I said for Christmas and all the pagan practices that go with it and false gods. Drunkenness. I had someone try to justify drunkenness. Okay. We always say, thus saith the Lord, chapter and verse. And there's a reason for that, because I want to line up with God's Word. I want to line up with Him. God's Word, right there. I want to please God. I want to do His will. I've, I've wasted most of my life doing my will and doing things my way. And letting the flesh get the better of me. I don't want to live that way anymore. So when it's talking about that, just real quick, then do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, chapter and verse. Remember that, brothers and sisters. Don't let anybody deceive you. Oh, it's just, it's, it's, I'm just doing it. Isn't it enough to say I'm doing it for Jesus Christ? No, chapter and verse. Is what you're doing actually in the Bible, when you say you're doing it to please God, and does it actually please God? 1 John 4.12 we read, in 1 John 4.12 it says, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. So loving Jesus Christ is keeping his commandments, and we show the love of God perfected in us when we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. How's that going this day? Brothers and Christ, how's it going in, our, in the body of Christ as a whole? People get on to me. Brother... Professing brethren, and some I believe are saved, some I believe are false, but the professing Christian world as a whole gets on me because I look at the body of Christ today and I say it's in a big mess. We're in a mess, brothers, says Christ. This world's falling apart, worse, getting worse and worse, and the body of Christ, we're seeing people drop left and right to the falling away. The body of Christ is not living the way, we're not doing everything God's way. I know I said we, we includes me, brother says Christ. I'm not just pointing the finger at everyone else. It includes me, it bugs me that, I, that you know, we're not doing things God's way, including me. And I'm trying. And I'm trying to motivate you, brother, sister in Christ, to have that heartfelt attitude of wanting to try to do things God's way. Okay. Some of God's commands, we just read one there. If we love one another, God's love is perfected in us. One of the commands is the love of the brethren. Brothers and sisters of Christ, I've had to break fellowship with brethren. I've had brethren break fellowship with me. I've had them go to the world. Remember what Paul said? I forgot the guy's name, but he talked about a guy that he left him having loved this present world. He's not mocking him. He's not name-calling, backbiting and whispering, whatnot, showing hate and disdain. He just says, the man left me, this brother in Christ left me, having loved this present world. He went to the way of the world. He fell into the world. The point I'm making is true love for the body of Christ today, the reason we're in such a mess, is when we fit a situation where we have to break fellowship with a brother or sister in Christ, or they break fellowship with us, we tend to treat them like they're lost, they're on their way to hell, and good riddance for, to them. Let them go to hell. No, 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 no. True love for them is are you still praying for them? I still pray for all the brethren that I fellowship, for the most part. I pray for the brethren that I was fellowshipping with. I pray for my mentor. I pray for the men that taught me things that went the way of the world. Okay? I pray for them. I talk to the Lord and say, I miss them. I miss my brothers in Christ. I wish they'd get back to, you know, back to that standing position from their fallen position. And I pray that God picks them back up. I miss my brothers and sisters in Christ. But that's not the attitude that brethren have today. The attitude brethren have today is, is they kick them to the curb and they kick dirt on them and they spit on them. Is that what we're supposed to do? 1 John 4, 7. Turn to 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, 
and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him, living a life of Christ. Jesus being the light. Here it is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. All right, stop for a second. We ought to love one another. Brother, sister, Christ, are you willing to give your life to a brother and sister in Christ? Are you willing to sacrifice your fellowship by preaching truth to them, even if it costs you that fellowship? Are you willing to give, one big thing is financially helping brethren. Right now, everyone's so into donating to this ministry so this one man can live his dream life, and we're so interested in donating to this Babel building so that we can keep this business structure going. But what about the body of Christ? When's the last time you've helped out the body of Christ? By donating something, clothes, food, some money so they can pay rent, pay electricity. The whole point, this is a whole other study, but the whole point of donations was never meant for a business like these Babel buildings. It's not meant for these so-called YouTube ministries that claim to be full-time ministry, and that's their, for the primary income. Donations were meant to go for the brethren as a whole. And yes, men in ministry are brethren as a whole. If they needed food and raiment, some of the money came out and went to them. But this is a, like I said, it's a whole other study from Peter or Paul when Paul talks about it. They that were lacking, they, those that had little had no lack. Those that had an abundance had nothing left over. Why? But it says they had abundance because all their abundance was given to those that were in need in the body of Christ so that everyone had food and raiment. Having food and raiment therewith be content. Everyone had a roof over their head. We take care of one another. We're there for one another. Actions, deed, you take time out of your busy schedule to, as a man in ministry that claims to be in full-time ministry. Do you actually take time out of your ministry to mentor brethren? Brothers and sisters Christ, do you take time out of your busy schedule to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ? The Bible talks about uh, crying with them that cry, mourning. When you have brethren that are hurting, do you take time out to be there and, and be there with them? If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his, capital S, Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We're going to get back to these studies once I get the, the house back in order. But um, proving your own self. How do you prove that you have the Holy Spirit in you? How do you treat the brethren? You might have to kick them to the curb. Not kick them to the curb. That's about it. You might have to break fellowship with them. I've had brethren kick me to the curb. I've never kicked them to the curb. The door is always there as long as they're willing to repent. If they're willing to turn back to God and do what God says and put the Word of God first, that door is always there. And even if they don't, if they come back and want to talk, I oftentimes still talk with brethren that I said I can't fellowship with you. It's been like six months. They come back saying, hey, I need to talk about something. Okay. There's times where you have to break fellowship with them. But how do you treat them? Whether you had to break fellowship with them or not, how do you treat the brethren as a whole? You believe what I believe or you're lost. You're out of here. Hey, I might be wrong. I never have that attitude. You need to believe the Bible. That's my attitude. You need to believe the Word of God. This is absolute truth. This is our foundation in all matters of faith and practice. What we believe, what we say, how we live, how we treat the lost world, how we treat each other, how we treat God. What pleases Him? We just talked about that. That is always right. And where I line up with that, it's not because I'm right, 
God's word's always right. And if I'm wrong, and I don't line up with that, God's word, the Bible, the King James Bible, then I'm wrong. Why? Because that's always right. That's my attitude. But you get some of those men that they are always right. Me, myself, and I. I'm always right. How dare anybody question me? All right. How do you treat brothers and sisters in Christ? How do you treat the lost world? But right here we're talking about the love of the brethren. How are you treating your brothers and sisters in Christ? 2 Corinthians, 7, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, we read, Every man according as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity. Some YouTube channel ministers have made it about necessity. They'll bully you. They'll guilt trip you. They'll try to bribe you. They went to the same three tactics that the Babel buildings use. The same three tactics that you see when it used to be television. The t TV evangelists. The same three tactics that a salesman uses trying to sell someone something at the door. Like the door-to-door -door salesman. Yeah, they use those tactics. They start with trying to bribe you, then bully you, and then guilt trip you. They try all three of those, and they're very effective in this world. It's very effective to get money out of people. How are you treating the brethren? When it comes to donation, are you helping a brother and you're doing it out of love? You're giving out of love? God's blessed you with abundance? You give out of love. You don't have money? You pray for them. You give them your time. That's the whole point. Like I said, if you had a house church in your area, when you have a brother, you might not have money, but your brother's like, I'm trying to build a fence. You're like, well, I'm going to go give him my time and my energy. And I'm going to help him build that fence. He needs to get that fence to keep the animals in. His roof is leaking. I don't have money. I'm, I'm, I'm a poor guy. I don't have a lot of money. But I can give him my time by helping him fix his, his roof that's leaking. And so on and so forth. Do you love the brethren by wanting to help them and be there for them? Not just about money, but to help be there for them. One of the commands we have, brothers, is Christ, and it's failing a lot in these last days, is we're supposed to love one another. Uh, so we love the brethren. What about love of the lost? Some people say we don't have to love the lost. We can hate the lost. You see, God hated someone. Yeah, God hated Esau. Absolutely. But we're not supposed to show hate for the lost world. 2 Corinthians 5.18. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5.18. True love for the lost world is preaching the truth to them. And if they don't want the truth, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. We go to somebody who does want the gospel. But you can have someone who spits. I've had someone spit in my face and get so mad. And then later come back all calm and I'm able to preach the gospel to them. You can't lose your temper. You can't start having hate and bitterness in your heart towards the lost world as a whole. You need to have that love to preach the gospel to them. Paul had such love for the brethren talking about uh, his kindred, the Jewish people, that he kept preaching the gospel to him, even after he said, I am done with you. I'm done with the Jewish people. You hard-headed, stiff-necked people. Hard-hearted, stiff-necked people. I'm done with you. And what happens? He'd see Jews that are lost, and his heart would just cleave to him and say, I want to see these guys get saved. And he'd preach the gospel to them. And then hate the same thing. You stiff neck, stiff, the hard hearted, hard, thick headed people, I'm done with you. I'm only going to the Gentiles. He did that three times. Why? Because he had a love of his people. He had a love for the lost. To see him get saved. Okay? Not to compromise, to see him get saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You know the armor of God, the part that talks about preaching the gospel? We are shod with the feet of the preparation of peace. We're to seek people getting saved. 
That should be our heartfelt desire to see people get saved. Now, is everyone going to get saved? No. Jesus said himself, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate that leadeth to, to heaven. But to hell, broad is the gate. And many there be that go in there and at. But our heartfelt desire, my love for my, my family members that are lost and have rejected me, you know, basically just cast me to the side, I still want to see them get saved. I want to see my brothers, I have two brothers, get saved. I want to see my mom and stepdad get saved. I want to see my grandmother get saved. I have all kinds of family in Oklahoma that I'd love to see get truly saved and born again. But they've pretty much written, some of them there have written us off like we don't exist. I don't exist. Given to us the ministry of reconciliation, 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We're not here to, we're here to convict people of their sin. Remember that, brothers and sisters. We're here to preach the gospel and convict the, the people of their sin and show them that they have a great need for Jesus Christ. But we're not here to condemn people. God will take care of that. God will take care of that. We tell them that they're on their way to hell because the Word of God says they're going to hell, but we're not the ones sending them to hell. That's what I mean by we're not to condemn them. We're not the ones sending them to hell. I have no authority on who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Do you, brother, says Christ? No. God does. Plant seeds. Someone else will come along and water that seed. We're in the ministry of reconciliation. You have the feet shod with the preparation of peace. Verse 20, now, when, now then we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. That's our prayer, be re reconciled to God. Brothers of Christ, one of the commands is to preach in the gospel. If you truly love the lost world, you're going to preach the gospel to them. You're going to give them a gospel tract. You give them some booklets. You might preach the gospel to the people you love, like closer people that you love and care about, 15, 20, 30 times. You might still be doing it. When the door opens, you try to witness to them still. It might be the 50th time. You're like, but the door opened again. God opened the door. I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to witness to them again. I love them. I want to see them get saved. To have that dedication and love for the lost world. I had someone who professed to be a saved sinner, professed to be a Christian, and she told me that um, she is, she's not called to preach the gospel. Some people are called to preach the gospel, but I'm not called. That's not a calling for me. I don't preach the gospel to anyone. That's not, that's not the heart of someone who's saved and born again. If God saves someone like me, if God saved a wicked sinner like me, He can save the other people, and I want to see Him save other people. That's the heartfelt desire of someone who's truly saved again. They've got to tell everybody what Jesus did for me. The man that is possessed with the devil. Jesus said, go tell everybody. I'm going to tell everybody. I can't keep it in. There's other stories in the Bible where it talks about where he told them, tell nobody what I did for you. Keep it quiet. The guy whose daughter was, was dead and Jesus raised his daughter from the dead. He's got to tell somebody. He went out and published it. To the point where Jesus couldn't hang out in the city anymore because people would mob him. He said to start preaching outside the cities. You just, Jesus does something for you, and you just have to go yell it on the rooftops. Jesus saved me. Jesus saved me. Me. You don't get it, because people just don't get that. Me. He saved me. I'm not worth saving. I'm worthless. But he saved me. 2 Thessalonians. If I forgot to read verse 21, 2 Corinthians 15, 21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. That should be our heartfelt desires to see people get saved. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I understand, brothers of Christ, that there's a lot of people that are being duped today. The Bible calls them simple. Deceiving the hearts of the simple. Okay? 
I understand there's a lot of people that are deceived. There's a lot of people that are going to choose the world. They're going to choose the flesh. And they're going to go to hell. And there's nothing that you're going to do to stop them. I understand that, brothers of Christ. But our heartfelt desire should be to witness to them. You should never, ever come across a person you've never witnessed to and say, hey, he wants to go to hell, let him. That should never be on your heart. You should be looking up saying, hey, I need to be here. I need to preach to that guy the truth. I need to give him a gospel tract. He might just be so stubborn he wants to go to hell. He might be part of this. But that doesn't relieve you of your responsibility to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ with your words and the life that you're living. We are commanded to preach the gospel. Are you doing it, brothers and Christ, when it comes to the lost? Are you loving your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you showing love for the lost world by preaching the truth to them? Here's the verse here. I wrote it down. I know there will be people that go to hell. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. This is the one talking about how broad the way is, but I want to like quote in the Bible for what it is instead of just paraphrasing. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gates, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. But our Now, Brother Chris, Sister Christ, but our heartfelt attitudes should reflect not in just words, but words indeed is that all men would get saved. That should be our heartfelt attitude. Yes, we understand a lot of people are going to go to hell. Very few people are going to make it to heaven. Okay? God gave mankind free will. They get to decide heaven or hell. They get that choice. But our heartfelt desire is to see all that all men would get saved. God's will is that all that God's will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God, God great, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's His attitude. He's the one that said what we just read there in Matthew seven thirteen. He knows a lot of people are going to hell, but He doesn't want He doesn't want them to. He didn't say, "I don't care if you believe or not, you're going to hell." I don't care if you repent and believe and confess both. Uh, no. His desire is to see people repent. I want you to get saved. He wants to save people. But he knows people are going to go to hell. Brother saying, we're supposed to have that same attitude. We understand, brethren, that the lost world, there's people that are going to go to hell. But we need to have that attitude of, I want to see him get saved. I'm going to witness to him. I'm going to hand him a gospel trap. Romans 10.1 is where we read about Paul. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, lost people... As a whole, Israel, is that they might be saved. Are you praying for your lost neighbors, brothers and sisters Christ? Are you praying for your lost family members, lost co-workers at whatever job you're doing? Are you praying, like the first part, loving your brethren? Are you still praying for your brethren that have fallen away? Are you praying for your brethren that are still standing? Are you praying for the lost world? Those that you'd like to see get saved. It's a commandment of God. Are you doing the commandments of God? Are you, is your heartfelt desire to do the will of God? What about prayer? We'll go. Through, we'll just kind of. I just kind of change the round a little. We're just trying to go over some con, uh, commands just real quick that God gives. Prayer. Okay. First Thessalonians five seventeen says, "Pray without ceasing." Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. You need something? Ask God. Is something bugging you about the Word of God? Okay. The Bible talks about it. You ask, you seek, you ask God for wisdom and prayer, and He gives it to all men liberally. If you can't figure out something, ask God. If you don't know what to do, ask God. You need help with something. Ask God. Brethren, you see them in those same conditions. Pray for them. Okay? Prayer. It's so important. Now, Revelation 5.8 says, and this is how important prayer is. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. 
Revelation chapter 5 verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the land, having one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Prayer is so important that God keeps all your prayers. Remember, what's the number one thing that gets in the way of prayer? When you hold iniquity in your heart. When you start getting into sin and wickedness and you hold on to it and you won't let it go and you try to justify it, God's not going to hear your prayers. Uh, King David said it in the Psalms. If I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. What prevents you from praying? Sin. When you get into the flesh and the world, it starts hindering your prayer life and it starts hindering God hearing your prayers. But that to the side, all your prayers other than that, God keeps them. It's precious to him. John 17, 14, we read, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray, not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from evil. Are you praying as I am so hard these days that God keeps me on the straight and narrow path? And living for Him, and that He keeps the brethren on the straight and narrow path. Keep us standing. Don't faint. Don't falter. Having done all to stand. Should keep us from the evil, this wicked world. I've been praying a lot for the brethren, what's going on in this world. Some of the wicked things that are going on in this world. I was like, Lord, please help the brethren and watch over them. Protect them. Help them to continue to live for you and be a light for you. 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then it goes in to sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How do we stay separate from the world? The word of God teaches us how to live. How we're supposed to live. What we're supposed to believe. The stands we take. How we treat the lost world. How we treat saved brothers and sisters in Christ. James 1.5 says, If any lack wisdom, here's the verse, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and it bringeth not, and it shall be given him. If any of you lack, lack, lack wisdom, you ask God. What is that? Prayer. Prayer. In Psalms 119.11 is where King David says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Okay? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Prayer. Lord, I don't understand this. Please show me. Lord, what do I need done in my life? When you look at the whole list of everything you're supposed to be praying for, then you can understand when the Bible says pray without ceasing. Yeah, I kind of pray without ceasing. That's the only way I can get all this in. Lord, I need your help on all this stuff. My day-to-day -day life, I need God's help every day. I need His mercy. I need His patience. I need wisdom. I need strength. I can do all things through Christ with strength me. Through Christ. Not through the flesh, not through the world, but through Christ. Okay? And this leads to the next command that I want to point out, which is, are you obeying it? Is reading the, wor reading the word, studying it, and living it. Okay? 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's a command. 2 Timothy 3.16, these are memory verses that we should have memorized. If you're newly saved, like I was at one time, I didn't have them memorized. But these are some verses you should get memorized. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Why do we study the word of God? So we can live it. Hide it in our heart and live it. Why do we read the Word of God? Because that's the only way you can hide it in your heart. You've got to read it day to day. Your flesh is always going to try to push the Word of God out. Always. That's why you need to stay in it on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalms 119.9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. How does God clean up your life? He does it through the word of God, his word. Don't do this, do this. Get that out of your life. Get, get this in your life. Get that out of your life. Okay. 
God teaches us through his word how we're supposed to live. Once again, how we treat the lost world, how we treat the brethren, how to put this body of flesh down. Psalms 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And there's so many verses I can go off of, but all me, by all means, brethren, get active in the comment section, put in verses that I did not hit on. And I'm reading my notes. Brothers this is Christ, there's so many verses that I missed on, that, that we could use, I didn't miss them, but we could use, when it comes to how important God's word is. Put your favorite verse in, in the comment section. Okay? When it comes to how important God's word is to you. Please do that. Okay? And the last part we're going to talk, because there's so many other commands that God gives, but these are big ones that if you're, these will lead to other commands, to other commands, and this just branches out all together. How you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ, how you treat the lost world, ministry of reconciliation, to study, the, read the Word of God and to study it and to live it. And here's this one right here, preaching the Word of God. Now you might be thinking, well, only men can preach the Word of God. When it comes to the body of Christ as a whole, you're absolutely correct. Only men can be pastors, preachers. Um, only men can be bishops, deacons. Ordained elders are men. Not just elders, ordained elders are men. Okay, those are different offices within the body of Christ that the Bible talks about for today. Absolutely. But as we get into this, this, this section right here, we're going to realize that there's more to it. 2 Timothy 4.2, this is to a young man in ministry. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. All longsuffering and doctrine. Men who get into ministry, we're commanded to preach the word. We're not commanded to pervert this so we can justify how we want to live. It's we're supposed to be preaching the word. This is our foundation on matters of faith and practice. We're to preach the word, we're to teach it. And when people start going against the Word of God, we reprove, we rebuke. And when brethren are, when you are following the Word of God, we exhort the brethren. If you are, like the other thing we've been talking about, if you're doing great on those things, praise God. How you treat the lost world, how you treat the brethren, gospel tracting, reading your Bible, praying. If you're doing these things, praise the Lord. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Don't give out. Don't quit. Keep going. Okay? We're going to preach the word and be instant in season, out of season. Right now we're kind of getting into out of season where the word of God is the final authority. That's getting way out of season. Even among those who claim to be Bible believers, this book is not the final authority for a lot of people. And when that's the case, you reprove, you rebuke, and you exhort when they are following it with all long-suffering and doctrine, encouraging the brethren to continue to follow this book, God's Word, the King James Bible. Ephesians 2.25, you say, well, that's just preachers, that's just them, right? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the watering by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or such things, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So all men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Brothers and sisters, brothers in Christ out there that are married, you're supposed to be preaching the word too to your wives. You're supposed to be washing your wife by the watering of the Word. You should be teaching your wife the Word of God. These days, it seems like it's the other way around. The wives are going to teach their men how to read. Nah. The husbands are going to be teaching their wives the Word of God. Washing by the Word of God. Are you reading the Bible with your wife every day? Are you praying with your wife every day? You're holding your wife accountable to this book just as she's holding you accountable to this book. This book. Whew. Yeah. Oh, no, it's just preachers. No, husbands, elderly men in the, in the faith, in the family, the eldest men should be reading. The family should be having a reading time 
If I, I'm not married, I don't have kids, but if I had a wife and five kids, we would have a certain time every day where we all sit down, probably in the evenings, it's usually the best time people do it, or you can do it in the mornings, but in the evenings when everything's said and done, you're sitting by the fire, if you have one, you all sit there and you read the Bible together. Okay. That gives us into Ephesians 6, 4, where it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them in the up in the nurturing and admonition of the Lord. You're supposed to be preaching the Word of God to your children. Read Bible stories that have lessons. Okay? You can read the Bible to your kids and teach them the Bible when it comes to lessons in life. What God says is right, what God says is wrong. And the most important thing is you don't tell them this is wrong and they say, why? You don't say, because I said so. That's the worst answer you can ever give them. If they come to you, if the child says, why is stealing wrong? And you just wrote, uh, you just told them a story in the Bible about stealing. Why is stealing wrong? Because God said stealing is wrong. And God is always right. That's what you need to instill in a child so when they get older, they've already got that in their head that God is right, His Word is right, and when they get to the age of accountability, they have to make a decision to serve God or go the way of the world. And they're more likely to choose God if they're raised in the admonition of the Lord. Not always, because sometimes the world has those hooks and grabs your children when they get older and they just go off in the world and you lose them to the world. But you're supposed to be preaching the Word of God to your children. Husbands, men in the family, elder men in the family are supposed to be preaching to the women of the family. Psalm 74, 4 says, Concerning the work of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. The words of thy lips. This book, Brother Jesus Christ, kept us from the ultimate destroyer, hell and the lake of fire. Now, in our, in our walk with the Lord, in this present life, as a saved sinner, how many times does this book save you? Present tense. You're doing something wrong, your life seems like it's going to fall apart, and God brings you back to this. And you go, wait a second, I was doing it the wrong way. I was trying to force this in my life, and God's like, eh, eh. And when you get back to doing things God's way, life seems to be a lot easier. Not physically, but spiritually. And oftentimes physically, too. God will bless you and take care of you. Okay. Mark 5, 12. Mark 5, 12. And that's where we're going to... I'm sorry, Mark 5, 17. We're going to end this study. Sorry for it being so long, but courageous man, foolish man... Do you have a, a heartfelt desire, going back over the whole study, you have a heartfelt desire to be where Jesus is, fellowship, looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living, and the day of the Lord, suffering for Jesus Christ? Do you have a heartfelt desire to obey His will, to do the will of God, to obey His commands? And we went over some of the commands, how you treat the, your brothers and sisters in Christ, how you treat the lost world. Are you reading your Bible and studying it and living it? Are you preaching the Word of God to people? If you're under that list, okay, what is loving God? Keeping His Word. Mark's 5.17, back to the story. And they began to pray Him to depart out of their coast. I see what you did for that man. I don't want you doing that for me. I love the dirty, wicked life that I'm living. I don't want that to happen to me. You need to leave. Not because of the, the, the pigs. Because they saw that man and what happened to that man, they were scared that he would do that for everyone. What? He's going to clean up my life? Because remember, this is the Old Testament. He's going to clean up. It was repent and be baptized for the mission of sins and believe that Jesus Christ was their king for the day of the Lord. Well, he's going to clean my life up and I have to get, you know, have to live, have a new life? No, no, no. Get out of here. We don't want you. And when he was coming to the ship, he, had, he who had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. 
Verse 20, And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Brothers, says Christ, those men were fools that told Jesus to get out of here. That man that Jesus saved, he was courageous. Despite all those people saying, we don't want this, get this man away. I don't care, I'm going to stand for that man, and I'm going to preach for that man, I'm going to live for that man. Brothers and sisters of Christ, are you being courageous? Which one are you? That heartfelt desire to be where Jesus is, and to do His commands, and obey Him, and live for Him? Or are you starting to act like some of those fools? Really, I'm going to have to put Jesus to the side, because the world. I'm busy right now with the world. I'm busy right now with the flesh. I'm busy right now with the me, myself, and I. Selfishness. Which is it, brothers and Christ? Which is it? I'm going to end this study with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Get out there. Get busy living for the Lord. Get busy tracting the ministry of reconciliation. I'm praying for you, brothers and Christ. Please pray for me. And I will see you in the next video.